as we begin our series and talking about life groups. One of the key components that of the church in general is discipleship. And one of the first avenues at Grace Point that we have to start the discipleship process is to plug people into small groups. And since it's such an important component to what Jesus designed for the church, it's, it's an important component that we have here at Grace Point. And so our goal is to raise up the next generation of disciple makers so that after we that are here are long gone, that the gospel continues to go forth for generation after generation after generation until Jesus returns. And so one of the key phrases that we are going to look at in Scripture, and it's what Jesus said when he called many of his first disciples, and it's the phrase, follow me. A very simple phrase. It's this call from Jesus to come walk with him, to do life with him, to learn from him, to walk alongside him, to see what he does and how he does it and with whom he does it. And the, one of the key passages is, it says, Matthew 9, 9, it says, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. So one of the things we are going to look at today is how do we make disciples? How do we make them? Like, is there a process? Is there a program? Is there a study? Is there, you know, a time frame? What is it? But before we can do that, we're going to say, who are the disciples? Who is a disciple? What makes you a disciple? And I think to truly understand who a disciple is or what a disciple is, we have to look, go back to the original disciples. And Jesus, being the original disciple maker, we're going to kind of, it seemed to work for him. You know, the church is still going 2,000 years later, so it seems to work. seems like a good strategy, so we want to keep that going. And so we want to see what he did, how he trained these guys up, who he trained. And so who were the disciples? And so we have to answer that question. Who were they? Were they religious leaders? No. Were they brilliant scholars? Were they the great minds of their time? No. Some were fishermen. Some were tax collectors. None of them were real high up in society. They weren't, you know, no one was going to say, yeah, I knew Matthew. I know Matthew. And it's kind of like more of a shame, like, yeah, I know who he is. He's the guy who, over, who stole my money last year, told me I owed more taxes than I really did. But Jesus looked at them and says, I know who I can make you into be. Because their skill set wasn't there. They were untrained. Most, like, most of them were uneducated. But Jesus says, follow me, and I will show you how to, make you how to make you fishers of men. I will teach you how to make the next generation of disciples. I will teach you what it means to truly follow after God's heart. Now, if, you've, if you know anything about the disciples... You know that one of the key things is that, that they messed up a lot. Jesus did not, have, Jesus did not pick the perfect disciples, and once he said, I'm, I will follow me, it wasn't like it was an easy path. We constantly see where they were making mistakes or they were assuming the wrong thing. Hey, Jesus, who gets to sit at your right hand? Well, neither of you. And then when they come to take Jesus, Peter takes out a sword and cuts off the guard's ear. Jesus says, what are you doing? He said, it's my time. But guess what? Jesus still loved them. He still, he walked them through those mistakes. He brought them along in the path. 
So what did Jesus do with them? As I said, he brought them along. They walked through life together. They got to see Jesus doing ministry in each town. He got, they got to see him heal the sick, help the blind to see, make the lame walk, to raise the dead, to call out the Pharisees, to correct and rebuke and to love. He got to see them. See, they got to see him show love to sinners that were rejected by society. People that everyone else in society said, you are worthless. And Jesus said, no. I love you. I give you value. And when Jesus declares that he has given you value, you are given value. What happens after Jesus trained them? Then what? Then what, then what did they do? Because Jesus eventually ascended, died on the cross, was raised from the dead, and then ascended. He left earth. He left them here. So then what? What, are they, what were they supposed to do? Well, Jesus' goal during those three years was to train them up so that he could send them out. And you know we are a result of what those 12 disciples did and what Jesus' work on earth was about. Because if... Jesus' plan had failed. This church does not exist. Christianity in of itself does not exist. But he designed it in such a way, he trained them in such a way that it was not going to fail. He sent them out so that the gospel could go forth from nation to nation to nation. Now at the end of Matthew Matthew chapter 28 in the Great Commission, Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So he's telling these guys, I'm getting ready to leave. I'm going back to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. I will be back. But in the meantime, this is your job. I'm passing the torch to you. Go make disciples. Train them up to follow me just as I have trained you. So how do we make disciples? First, we make disciples by imitating Jesus. It says in Matthew chapter 9, it says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So, as we see, Jesus was going throughout all these cities, and he's teaching, and he's preaching, and he's healing, and he's doing all of these things. But what do we see that he did? Who did he bring with him? He brought his disciples. Could Jesus have done this by himself? Absolutely. Probably been easier. You don't have to worry about them saying something they shouldn't or doing something they shouldn't or going somewhere they shouldn't. But he brings them with him so that they can see how he is doing it. And he tells them. He says, these guys, they need help. They're helpless. They need someone to guide them. They need someone to lead them. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So he tells them what to do. Here's the problem. Here's what you do. You pray for more workers. You pray for people to come and to work alongside you. You pray for people to raise up. You pray for the next generation of believers in Christ. Because at some point, you are going to need that next generation. At some point, you are not going to be here anymore. Because Jesus knew that at some point he was leaving. He knew he was leaving earth. And he also knew that they were at some point they were going to leave earth. And the same is true for us. And if that's a surprise to you, I'm sorry I broke the news to you, that we don't all live on earth forever. So it is critical that we are raising up the next generation of followers of Christ. 
that we are investing in others. Even when it's hard, it's inconvenient, they're frustrating, they don't do what you told them to do. Jesus still did it. And he's telling us to do it as well. The next thing we see is that we have to make disciples by prioritizing people over programs. In Matthew chapter 12, it says, He went on from there and entered their synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? He said to them, Which one of you has a sheep? If it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out. Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. The man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the other. The, like, the last time I, I preached, we talked a little bit about how the Pharisees would come up with all of these new laws. They weren't laws that were biblical. They just kind of took a biblical law, and they just added a bunch of stuff to it. So for them, they were trying to trap Jesus in this situation. So, hey, you know, you know healing's... It's kind of illegal to do on the Sabbath. It's breaking the law. You said, really? Is that so? So so if you have a sheep and it falls in a ditch, you're just going to let it die? And they're scratching their head. No, I wouldn't wouldn't want that to happen. (laughs) It says, this guy, his hands withered up. So you're saying your sheep is more valuable than this guy? He said, it, it, is, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. You know, we don't deal with a lot of Sabbath issues. And we, we know that, we understand that what Jesus did, it didn't make the same laws as that, that your Jews, your Jewish culture would have typically followed. And so he installed a new set of laws. And he said, this is how we're going to live. And for us, and you know, we don't often deal with, do we work on the Sabbath? What is work? Do we walk too far? Do we do this? Do we cook? Those aren't issues that we typically deal with. For us, it's oftentimes that we want to say that this is what you do to make a disciple. This is the program that you follow. This is the study that you go through. This is the book that you read. You know, this is, these are all the steps. And so we want to box it in to this one short-term area. Well, after, after you decide you're going to follow Christ, we're going to have this class, and then you're going to be a disciple. Jesus says it's not like that. It's, Jesus didn't, when Jesus did it, he didn't set up a program, and they do a two-day-a-week two week study, and that was it. And he says, guys, come along with me. Let me show you how to do this. Now, am I saying like a, a, a Bible study in this capacity is wrong? Absolutely not. Are they beneficial? Absolutely. Can they be helpful in a discipleship relationship? Yes. But I'm saying it's not just confined to that. I'm saying it's much more than just a one-week study. If you want to disciple someone, you're not going to do it one hour a week. Just coming to a Sunday morning service isn't sufficient for discipleship. Just coming to sing with us or hear Andrew or I preach, you're not going to grow in the way that God has designed you to just by doing that. We want you to flourish. We want to teach you and train you and have someone come alongside you to raise you up to follow Christ in the way that he has designed. The third thing we see is that we need people to walk through life with. Because the truth is that we are not designed to be alone. I know some of you probably, you may feel like you are. Like you would just rather not deal with people ever. But we're not, that's not the way God made us. 
God didn't make us to live in isolation. He designed us to live in community. And specifically, his church. Yes, you can watch sermons online. And you can listen to the music online. And you can sing along at home. But there is such an important component that you miss by not coming here. By not being a part of what we're doing here. Because you don't get the interactions. You don't get to have the conversations. You don't have people that meet with you every single week. But the truth of the matter is, we're a growing church, which is an amazing thing. But as a part of that, it means that we can't connect with everyone here. You just can't. It's not realistic. So that's why we have small groups. We have small groups as a way that you can have more deep and meaningful conversations with people on a, on a consistent basis. People that you can go to. People that will care for you. Will pray for you. Because this isn't really a conducive setting for questions. So Andrew and I say something that sounds weird or way off base, and you're like, that, that just doesn't sound right. And I assure you it's happened. Probably happened today. But the reality is, you can't talk to us about it right now. You, could, you can feel free to after the service, by all means. But generally, in a small group setting, it's a lot more, it's set up for that. That you can talk about, like, hey, this is what he said. Do you know what he meant? And they may know. They may be like, yeah, it was really weird. I can't believe, I don't know what he was talking about. But it may be like, hey, no, this is, no, this is what he meant. Or they're like, hey, let's, let's go ask him. Let's go see what he was talking about. But in a small group setting, you're able to say, hey, look, guys, I'm struggling with this. You know, I have this addiction going on in my life, and I just can't not kick it. Will you pray for me? Will you hold me accountable? Will you be there for me? Or you have someone in your group that you can look up to. Someone that is further along in their walk with Christ than you are, and say, hey, man, can, can you just walk, can you just come with me and let me follow you and just do life with you? Just let me see what it is that you do that makes you love Jesus so much. Show me how to love Jesus like you do. Or maybe you're someone who is in the opposite boat. You see someone in, your, in the church or in your small group and you're like, hey, won't you, why don't you come follow me? Let me just work with you and teach you. And now, don't make, don't force someone. Like if they say, yeah, I really don't want to follow you. Like, I, don't, I don't think what you do is the greatest. Then End the conversation. Don't, don't keep pushing it. But the truth is that we have, we need to have someone. One, I think at all stages in our life, we need to have someone that we look to. Someone that can show us how to love Christ more. Because the truth of the matter is, there's always someone that knows more about Jesus and loves Jesus in a way and teaches us something that no one else is going to or that we don't already know. And if you don't think that's the case, then you should probably check yourself. Because we all have room to grow. There's areas that we need to fall more in love with Jesus. We also, if you're a follower of Christ, you need someone that you can be investing in. Someone that you can be pouring your life into. Someone that you can be walking through life with. Someone that you can share your, that the, your past struggles. How, how did you get past them? How, how can you help them get past it? We want to follow Jesus' model for discipleship. We want to do discipleship as close to what Jesus did as we can. Because when he made the original disciples, he designed the church in such a way that it is going to continue to grow. And for Grace Point to continue to grow, it is vital that we start investing in the next generation of believers that we start training up 
people to love and follow Jesus. You know, over the next uh, few weeks, we're going to have some sign-up sheets. I don't have them this week. should have them. I believe we're going to have them next week. And just find a small group that you can plug into. If you sign up for one, and there's no pressure. You're not, you're not signing like a, a year-long contract. Go check it out. Find one, find one that works for your schedule. Go check it out. If you go and say, these people are strange. I want something a little different. You know, it's no, no hard feelings. Go find, some, go find one that works for you. And we have such a broad range of small groups. We have some that are more intensive, that they are walking like through books of the Bible, going verse by verse and just seeing how deep they can get into the, into the Word. We have some that meet together, and it's more fellowship-oriented. They have some Bible study. It's more like, how, how can we pray for you? How can we love on you? How can we, what did you think about this? And it's more of an open discussion. We have some that meet way before dawn. And it's a men's group that they walk through and they meet daily during the week. We have women's groups that meet throughout the week. So we have a variety. But it is important that you find one that works for you. Find somewhere that you can plug into. Find somewhere that you can be a part of it. Be a part of the community. Because chances are, if this is all you're getting, you're not getting enough. You're not, getting, you're not feeding your spirit enough to grow in the way that God has designed. And for us, we don't want you to stay where you are. We want you to continue to grow and to follow Christ on a much deeper level. Let's pray. God, we do. We thank you for um, your word. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your design, that it wasn't um, just a kind of a, a mistake that just, it just kind of happened to work. But no, you had a plan from the very beginning. You had a design for your church. You had a design for your people to follow you and love you. And I do that pray that as a church that we pour into the next generation and we love on people and care for people just as you did. We want to invest in people in such a way that they are seen, that they know that they um, have value in you, that you deem them as worthy. And so God, I just, I pray that these that people here, that if they don't know you, that they will come to know you, that they will trust in you as their Savior. And for those that have and just, they don't, they're confused as to what the next step is. I just pray that they'll find someone that they can, that will invest in them or find a small group that they can plug into. So God, we want people to love and know you in such a way that it completely transforms their life. So be with us and guide us as we seek to do just that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, as we come to this time of communion, we understand that what Jesus did for us is so beyond what we can understand. You know, Jesus, as I said, Jesus modeled love and compassion for his disciples so that they could see it. But he modeled it best at the cross. When he went to the cross, he didn't go for his closest friends. He didn't go by putting up a fight. He wasn't dragged there. No, Jesus went willingly. And he died for his enemies. People like me. People like you. People who have betrayed him, have kicked him. And ultimately, we are the ones who nail him to the cross. But guess what? He didn't regret it. He said that we were worth it. Because he didn't want us to have to be separated from him from eternity. And it wasn't because that Jesus needed us. It wasn't like he was missing something. But he knew that we were. And he didn't want that to be the case for eternity. So he went to the cross on our behalf 
And so as you're taking communion today, I want you to spend some time reflecting on that, that it was his body that was broken for you, and he did so on your behalf. So as the elements are passed out, just hold on to them, and then we will take them after everyone has received them. As you take the bread, remember that it was his body that was broken for your sins. As you take the cup, remember that it was his blood that was shed for you.